Welcome to Back on the Broomstick, a modern witch's spoken word grimoire, where two witchy friends from way back are reconnecting to their pagan roots after a long period of mundanity. We're rewalking the path of the wise and trying out all the latest spells, rituals, and magical theory in today's witchcraft and pagan practices. So grab your wand and your incense, your cauldron and your crystals, and join us as we get Back back on on the Broomstick. Hi, and welcome to Back on the Broomstick. What are we talking about today, Layla? Tonight, we'll be talking about seances, Ouija boards, and things that go bump in the night. We're going to be talking about all things spooky and ghosty for this very last Friday episode of the witchy season of the spooky season. I love ghosts. Can I just say that? I wanted to start out with the fact that we have a ghost story of our own to share. Let's see. It was quite a while ago. I'm not going to say how long ago. Shell and her significant other at the time and my, were we married yet? My husband. We all went on a trip. Yeah. Where'd we go, Layla? Where'd we go? We decided to go up to a place in upstate New York where my dad lived, that I had lived as a child, my family house. And this house happened to be very haunted. It was well known amongst my family and friends that this house had so many ghosts in it. Everyone that went there had some type of experience. And there was even a spooky backstory to go along with it. So imagine this, folks. Picture it. Upstate New York, 1991. And Layla says, hey, you want to go spend the weekend at my dad's haunted house? And we were like, yeah, that'd be fun. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So the backstory of this house, which I'm not exactly sure is true. And in a previous episode of the Stoned Witches Hour, we did try to research this family legend and see if there was any truth to it. And we found some hints that it might possibly sort of kind of in a roundabout way be true. But anyway, I don't care about the history. The bottom line is that shit's haunted. Very haunted. So family lore says that when this house was first built, a young man and his wife moved in and the young man goes to work, comes home early one day and finds his wife in the middle of a very compromising position in one of the upstairs bedrooms with the neighbor. Typical 1800s. Rather than stop them, he very quietly does not disturb them, goes outside to the shed and gets his hunting rifle and then goes upstairs and unfortunately um, deceases both of them in the bedroom. Good way to put it. Bravo. Yeah. So I'm trying to be I'm trying to be like less spooky here. But (laughs) so after doing that, he then takes a rope that he'd also gotten from the, the garage out back and hangs himself in the stairwell. Now, people have claimed to see shadows of his ghost, to hear them fighting upstairs, to hear the gunshots. There's all sorts of spooky stories that happen in this house. So we get there and we use my grandmother's old Ouija board that was in the house. Again, another great idea. And we decide to use this at night in the room at the top of the stairs, which is where all of this supposedly happened. It also happens to be the room that Shell decided she was going to spend the night in. A.K.A. fuck around and find out. (laughs) That is like your middle name, I'm pretty sure. For real. So we get there. We do the whole thing. We've got candles going. We've got the Ouija board in the middle of the bed. We've got incense. We're calling spirits and casting circles and telling what happened. Nothing. 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 But But Smart Us decided we were going to record it. You had this old VHS freaking yeah, camcorder. This ginormous thing. camcorder. <laughs> oh my God. Like the, the rest on your shoulder kind. And we had that sitting on a dresser near the door to this bedroom facing the bed so we could capture the entire room and the entire Ouija board seance. You know, I think I, I have that video still, that, that little cassette in a storage unit. I know. And I'm going to make you dig it out because here's what happened. So we already said we set up the Ouija board, candles, circles, the whole nine. We had the camera set up to record all of it. And then despite the fact that we all could feel the energy in the air, we all could feel like there were ghosts or someone waiting to talk to us. Nothing happened. Like the Ouija board planchette did not move at all. Like not even a little bit. Not what you had promised. You had promised a weekend full of mayhem. I did. I totally did. And it was a dud. It was an absolute dud. So after long hours of nothing happening, when the camcorder shut off because the battery died, we decided to call it quits. 
We pack everything up and go to bed. Now, the next morning, we got out of that house pretty quickly early in the morning. And I wasn't sure why until we got in the car and started talking. Now, let me tell you why we wanted to get out of that house fast. Why did we get out of the house fast, Shell? Because you're a jerk. So (laughs) Layla puts me to bed in this bedroom and she's like, oh, you know, this is where the guy found his wife and the late and the other guy. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. How bad can it be? Yeah, nothing happened with the Ouija board. Yeah, right. I got abruptly woken up and I'm not generally a wake up abruptly person. And I got abruptly woken up and it was like there was this man hovering over me with like both of his hands like coming at me, almost like they're going to strangle you. And I felt like if I stayed in that bed, I was going to get attacked. I didn't sleep all goddamn night, you jerk. And (laughs) yeah, nothing happened with the Ouija board because he was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to wait till they're in that bed. And my ex-husband, husband husband at the time, was in that room with me. And he was just like, we we can't stay here. And I'm like, yeah, but we can't wake up Layla. You know, (laughs) you're at your dad's house. I'm trying to be a polite guest. And we're literally freaking sweating bullets in this room just trying to make it till dawn. Like this guy was angry. You shouldn't have put me in that bed, man. No one should sleep in that bed. He was mad. He was mad. (laughs) Now I'm I'm not surprised to put two psychically sensitive people in that room was probably a very bad idea, but I wanted to get the fuck out of there. (laughs) So while we're hearing these stories, I'm fiddling around with this camcorder. Now here's the thing. While we were recording our dud of a Ouija board session, you know, we're, we're trying the Ouija board, nothing's happening. And suddenly we hear a click and we check it out and it was the camcorder stopped. And we had determined it was probably just the batteries. Not had a battery died. or something. Yeah. So we kind of packed it up. It was really late at that point. We figured nothing was happening. So while we're in the car, I'm fiddling around with the camcorder and it turned on. The batteries were fine. They were almost completely full. So I thought that's weird. And I rewind and play back what we had recorded. And interestingly, as we were doing our last Ouija board session, you could hear someone come up the stairs really fast and really mad. You ever had like, you know, your dad come home for work and you know you're stomp, about stomp, to get in stomp, trouble? Stomp, 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 yeah. And you could hear them get louder and louder as someone stomped up the stairs. And then there was a huge bang and a no. And then the video, the picture shook and shut off. But in the moment... We didn't hear that. All we heard at the time was the click of it shutting off. And we just assumed it was the batteries being dead because we heard nothing else. Real world ears, so to say, didn't hear that. And when we saw that, I was shook. I have chills right now. It's freaking me out. Because that man was angry when he came up the stairs and he was angry when I was in that bed. And yeah, like I was okay never going back to your dad's house again. (laughs) And you never have. I Yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't. But, you know, some people are like, oh, yeah, you know, that wasn't real. No, like I was scared. Like yeah. in the middle of the night when I got woken up, that face was right in front of me. I was shook. I was shook. Yeah. And you're not the only person who's had experiences in that room. I've had experiences in the entire house. People in my family. I have a million cousins, like no joke, a million cousins. They have all everyone. Every family reunion, we all have stories of ghostly activity in that house. And I mean, you know, you know, ever since my late teens, my grandpa's been following me around. Yeah. You know, I I grew up with a ghost in my mother's house. So it's not like this was like my first encounter and it spooked me. (laughs) This guy was pissed. He's angry. He's not a happy guy. But, you know, experiences like that have been happening to people in every culture, in all parts of the world. or hundreds, if not thousands of years. People have always been fascinated with those that have gone before us, our beloved dead, and maybe have come back. I just want to point out something that is kind of a seasonal thing. You know, they say, well, you know, the veil is thinner and, you know, for for Samhain and and for Beltane is really Mm -hmm. the thinnest time. I'm on that bandwagon that that veil is relatively thin all the time. Um, I know not a lot of people follow that train of thought, but I do. And I I don't think spirit contact is limited to October and May. And I do believe that it's thinner in those times, but I don't believe that means that it's inaccessible at other times. Right. You know, I think it's accessible, like you said, all year round. You can always cross the veil depending on their strength, your abilities, you know, what you're doing. 
we talk to our our ancestors all the time but i do feel that because of the energies of life and death that that makes it easier more common you know more likely to just kind of slip and happen but kind of like instead of the door being floppy it's just like propped open yeah yeah that's a good way to look at it yeah i love that actually that's that's exactly how i think you know what i mean yeah but I, I do agree. I think it's definitely not blocked off, I don't feel, at any time of the year. So people have been trying to contact their dead all the time, particularly back in the Victorian era, back in the early 1800s, it kind of reached a peak. You know, they were fascinated with death. They had the memento mori, the little charms of death that people would wear of loved ones. They had all these customs about dressing in black and how long you should mourn for your dead. And they tried to contact them a lot because death was so close. You know, the infant mortality rate was extremely high. Then you hit, you know, the mid 1800s. And I mean, the the, the Civil War, I don't have to tell you, it was freaking traumatic. OK, like you woke up and your son and your husband were there and you went to bed and they were dead, you know, and then. I don't know if you've been to Gettysburg. Well, I know you have, but listeners don't know if you've been there. But like, you feel like these people are walking around and don't know they're dead. Like, it's almost like their death was so shocking that they don't realize they're dead. And like Lincoln's wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, during that time period was always trying to contact her son. You know, people were devastated at losing people you know, they didn't lose them to disease or, or thing, you know, health issues. Like you wake up and they're fine and you go to bed and they're dead. And, and that trauma really drove a mass population to want to contact their dead. It was at the late 1840s in upstate New York, actually, in the Rochester area, when the, the Fox sisters, that's really where the spiritualism movement and the whole popularity of seances began. And the word seance is a French word. And it means session. And I don't know why they named it seance, but I think they were fascinated with the whole idea of French culture. I'm not sure, but it sounded fancier than a ghost session. So they. So when it. we smoke, do we call it a seance? I mean, you could. if Because we used to call it a session. Fulmer seance. <laughs> yeah, right. I guess when we're being fancy, you have to get me one of those big, long cigarette holders for my joint, and then we could totally do that. That would be so fun. Right? That would be great. We could have a little tea party that way. I'm in. But do you realize, and a lot of people don't know this, that they actually, because Mary Todd Lincoln was grieving her son, she used to actually have seances at the White House. Yep. Imagine if they, if, if you saw in the news, oh yeah, so, you know, last weekend there was a seance at the White House. Yeah. And she is not the only first lady to do that. Um, let's see. So Mary Lincoln did. Uh, and let's see. Also, Edith Wilson and Florence Harding, two other first ladies also had seances in the White House. Nice. Yeah. So the Fox sisters in upstate New York really kind of started this whole thing. Uh, they were three young women that said that there was a ghost in their house of a, a peddler who had been murdered. And they could communicate with him. And he would communicate from the spirit world through knocking or rapping. And that was how a lot of different mediums would talk to their spirits back then, was some sort of table movement or knocks or knocking. And it was very limited to mostly yes, no, and I can't answer. Uh, you know, one knock for yes, two for no, and three for I can't answer that question. Boy, have ghosts advanced in communication. <laughs> Right. So that was kind of limited. And then they started doing other things like really bad. They would wrap out the letters of the alphabet. So like one for A, two for B, three for C. That's like Morse code, man. Right. So you can see that that would get very convoluted and very difficult. They were always kind of looking for ways to make it easier because that obviously would take a very long time. Sometimes they would state the alphabet, like they would just say A, B, C, and then the spirit would knock when they got to the right letter. But that also took a very long time. So into this came automatic writing. So some mediums started, you know, capitalizing on the fact that their counterparts were just listening to knocks and people would get bored at these seances. And they started doing different types of automatic writing, which is basically holding a pen, a pencil, piece of chalk, and closing your eyes or going into some type of trance and letting spirit work through you to write out a message. Now, I've never done that myself, but what I have done is I have transcribed what someone was saying while they were 
kind of invoking a, a greater spirit. So, I mean, that wasn't really automatic writing, but they were channeling and I was transcribing what was being said. Now, seances in the 1800s were less channeling and were more the idea of lights flickering or spirits trying to to knock on things or move things. More of a, I'm going to prove I'm here versus have a conversation. Right. And I think that was part of it is it really helped people to feel like something spooky or supernatural was happening. You know, if someone just starts saying something, you might not know that that's a ghost or a spirit speaking through them. It gave the impression that they were still physically there. And that was, you know, quote unquote, proof. If something knocked on a door where no one's next to it, that's proof of a ghost. And so that kind of went crazy in the 1800s. That was like super popular. Everybody had seances. It was like the thing to do. But then that Cybert report kind of put a wrench in it. Cybert report? Yeah. 1887, the Cybert Commission report started to kind of take away the credibility of spiritualism and seance type stuff and kind of made it into, you know, there's always going to be those fakes. And they highlighted the fakes and cast doubt on the people who are really providing mediumship. And it kind of went away a little bit. But then there was a different type of resurgence in the 40s and 50s, you know, the same type of thing. But then the Ouija board comes out or Ouija board or talking board or spirit board, whatever you'd like to call it. Well, the Ouija board came out in 1886. I mean, I'm I'm talking mainstream Ouija boards. Mainstream was more of the 30s and 40s. It did become more popular there. But in 1886 in Ohio, it was either reported in the papers that people were mediums, instead of using this wrapping thing, were actually using a board of sorts that had an alphabet on it. And they were using a, a pointer, a, what they called a planchette. And what this started out is, is the planchette originally had a pencil attached to it. And the medium would put their fingers on it and spirit. It's like a combination of automatic writing and talking board kind of. Exactly. Except there was no board. It was just paper. And then spirit would move the planchette and write with the pencil attached to it. And someone somewhere in Ohio, I guess, decided that these writings with this planchette and pencil were too illegible. Apparently ghosts have bad writing. You die and your writing goes to shit. I'm alive and my writing is shit. <laughs> so they determined that like, Putting out nice, neat letters and then just having the planchette point to them was easier to understand than actual writing. And that's where it took off. And a gentleman, a coffin maker slash undertaker named E.C. Reich, started making Ouija boards. I mean, a lot of people did. I just think it's wild that this guy started making them as a coffin maker. Ironic. Right? He took up with a businessman named Charles Kennard to try and sell these boards to a wider audience. Charles Kennard, as many American businessmen are wont to do, then cut Reich out completely, took the Ouija board idea, and went to a man named Elijah Bond. It's the American way. Right? Woohoo! Go America. In 1890, Kennard and Bond patented the boards, and that became known as the Ouija board. Where were the Ouija boards first produced? Not Salem. Really? Because we were told Salem. Uh, nope. Actually, the, the Ouija board that we know today was first produced by the Kennard Novelty Company in Baltimore, Maryland. Interestingly enough, they incorporated the day before Halloween. And the Ouija board that they made looks a lot like the one that we use today. So Ouija boards continued to be made in Baltimore until the Fold family sold it to the Parker Brothers. And the Parker Brothers then moved Ouija manufacturing to their base of operations in Salem, Massachusetts. So it didn't start to be manufactured in Salem until 1967. And that year, it sold 2 million boards. Before that, it was manufactured in Baltimore, Maryland. Oh, because see, I thought it was the opposite. In 1890, Kennard and Bond patented the board. And fun fact, in the patent office is where they named it. And they had a medium there named Helen Peters Nosworthy. And she used the board. And they asked the board itself what its name was. And it spelled out O-U-I-J-A. What does that mean? Does that mean something in a language? Do we know? Well, that depends on who you ask. Supposedly, they asked the board what it meant. And the Ouija board said that it was an ancient Egyptian phrase meaning good luck, which is complete bullshit. Um, <laughs> Weird. Right? Charles Kennard is, has been known to say that Ouija 
uh, was revealed to him through the board. And it's the combination of the French and German words for yes, we, and ya. But nobody really believes that. Some people say that there was like a some cultural icon at the time that had a name that was similar and that Helen just misspelled it and was trying to spell out that person's name. Nobody really knows. It reminds me of how they come up for names of weed. Right? <laughs> no rhyme or reason. No rhyme or reason. They just kind of pull it out. So after that, uh, its popularity absolutely soared. They used it as a parlor game. And then after World War I, you know, like you were saying earlier with the Civil War, it became popular after that. And then after World War I, you know, people again were grieving and having a hard time processing the loss and wanted to connect. So it became, became popular. I think it outsold the Monopoly board, which is the only time anybody has ever done that right after World War I. You and I grew up in an age where our grandparents were whooping it up in the 40s and 50s. And my grandmother was an entertainer, right? You know how that generation, they entertained, you know, mm-hmm. they'd have yeah. people, people over would for come cards. over. Yeah. yeah. And people would come over and my, my grandparents had a Ouija board, which is so funny because that was the grandma who thought me being a witch was just like Satan's job, which I actually, when my grandma passed away, I obtained that Ouija board copyright 1949. But that's what you did. You know, everybody got together and went to, Joe and Sally's house on a Saturday night and you drank shots of whiskey and played with the Ouija board and played cards. That was like normal fun back then. Yeah, exactly. It was marketed as like a, a family, like a social game and a way to contact the dead. You know, it was like, oh, go hang out with your dead relatives. Have yeah. a good time. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. It was even um, on an I Love Lucy episode. Did you know that? No. In 1951, there was an I Love Lucy episode where Lucy uses a Ouija board with a businessman trying to get him to do something. I'm not sure what, but she uses the Ouija and it's all lighthearted fun. Like there's no evil or terror associated with it at all. That came later. That was actually the first witchy thing I ever got in life. When I was 14 years old, I asked for a Ouija board for Christmas and I got it. Oh, see, yeah, I still have it. Good, clean family fun. Right. (laughs) <laughs> so where did this whole idea because we all know the idea that the Ouija board is it's demonic it's evil you're gonna let in terrible spirits if you use it whatever so why do people think that you know I think that there comes a point in time where every generation is kind of swayed by TV and whatnot and I just think that somebody decided they didn't like it and projected that to the world and the world went along with it like the world can tend to do you know my grandparents it was a parlor game and then you know if you and i pulled out a ouija board 30 years ago good lord i don't even know what would happen to us you you know what i mean (laughs) yeah like it just it went from a fun family game to like taboo I'm pretty sure, and we've talked about this before, but I'm pretty sure it was the movie The Exorcist in 1973 that really, really fucked up the reputation of the Ouija board. Only movie ever scared me. Right? Super fucking scary. Now, there was a another movie called The Uninvited in 1944 that also featured a scary Ouija board, but that didn't, like, grab the culture and and freak the fuck out of them like The Exorcist did. And that's really where people started thinking that if you use a Ouija board, you're going to let demonic spirits in. And that idea has just been cemented over and over again by movies and media. You and I have always used Ouija boards. Yeah. Actually, I have a collection of maybe eight or ten. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I get what you're saying that, you know, not every otherworldly being out there is all nice and happy and love and sunshine like the angry ghost at your dad's house. <laughs> but you get what you call. If you're going to call some angry, angry spirit, then you're going to get one. You know, I I think it's kind of you get what you call. But I also agree with sometimes you might call your sweet, loving, cookie bacon grandma and some angry asshole spirit comes in because they got something to say and you're the only one picking up the phone to listen. I mean, yes, that's possible, but not very likely. Like you said, you get what you call. And it's not like the Ouija board has some extra power that automatic writing or other forms of communicating with spirit don't have. So it's not very likely. I agree with you. It's definitely not the fault of the Ouija board. 
Okay, quick tangent. One of the times that I went to visit Shell in Salem, we went to one of my absolute freaking favorite places in Salem. Where? Talking Board Museum. We did. It was fabulous. If anybody comes to Salem, go to the museum. Go. It is amazing. Absolutely amazing. And they change the exhibits once in a while because he has so many boards that he he's able to I put them up. I think he said every three months. Yeah, it's just fantastic. Like he has even the original printing plates from like the very first boards made back way back. I mean, his collection is just amazing. And and he'll talk your ear off about all anything about it. It's just absolutely fantastic. So neither shall nor I have a collection like that, <laughs> but it's fantastic. Okay, so tangent over, but talking boards, Ouija boards started out is simply an easier way for people to communicate with those that have gone before us with spirit. It started out as a way to make contacting spirits easier. There's nothing inherently evil about it. If you're calling something crazy, you might just get something crazy. And all right, well, let's talk a little bit about how do you use a Ouija board safely? Like, how would you call people whether, you know, if you're trying to just be like, who's here in this house, rather than say an ancestor or someone like that, like, what would be a good way to go about that? Again, it depends on your intent. You know, if you're looking to talk to an ancestor, call an ancestor. If you're looking to fuck around and find out, ask who's here. You and I have always generally, you know, at least put up some sort of magical shield, whether it be cast a circle or just put that bubble around us, whatever the case may be. But as with talking with any type of spirit, doing any type of spirit communication, you don't know if you're going to get a stranger or your cookie bacon grandma. You know, you got to kind of proceed with caution. Good point. If you're going into a house where you don't know what kind of spirits are there, It's pretty much a mixed bag. You're going to get whatever is there. And you might not know if they're cranky or if they just want to offer you a cookie. Just like going out and chatting with people in New York City. Proceed with caution. You you know what I mean? I mean, you like everything, just be smart, you know. So we always, like I said, we either cast a circle or kind of put that protective bubble over us. Cut ties at the end. That's another thing we do. We always kind of do the, we're done here. You need to go. You know, in the movies, they're like, always say goodbye. I don't like the way they word it, but the the sentiment behind it, yeah. Yeah. You know, you kind of have to close that door. Don't bring them home with you. Right, yes. You said in an episode a while back about something you like to do, say, when you leave a working like that, or when you leave a place that you know is haunted, you will envision and empower, like, scissors in your mind. and Cutting that cord. And cut that cord, you know, cut around you to make sure nothing follows you home. Uh, some people like to wipe their feet on a carpet until they get a static charge to make sure that that will sever any ties. But, yeah, the goodbye thing is pretty important. I think that's a good part of it when doing any type of spirit working. And it doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to, like, scramble to wipe the planchette over the word goodbye or anything. Literally just say goodbye. Any type of symbolic ending or formal ending will work. The important part is making an ending, you know, set an end point and be firm about it. That's really all it is. But more in the magical way and not the hokey Hollywood way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, it's like doing any type of spell. You want your set and your setting and your intention to all be very clear. You know, it, say you're going to try and contact something that's in the house and you don't know who it is. Like Shell said, you do your circle. Maybe you'll have protective herbs and crystals. You'll have your candles. You'll have your protective symbols or charms that you feel are empowered that would keep you safe. And also things that will call to the spirits that you want to come. You know, if you know anything about them, if you know it's a child, maybe you'll have a toy. If you know it's a mother, maybe you'll have a baby blanket. Or, you know, if you know they were an artist, maybe you'll have a, an artist brush or something like that. But, you know, set it up to be most conducive to that spirit coming and and also to you being protected. But, you know, again, I think it, a lot of it goes with intent. And, and a good example is one time when you were here last fall, you and I made homemade Ouija boards <laughs> because, you know, if you're going to fuck around and find out, go big or go home. Um, so, you know, we made homemade Ouija boards and went up to Gallows Hill. We didn't cast a circle for that. But I remember that night at your dad's house, we did because we knew we were dealing with some nasty shit. Whereas at Gallows Hill, we were like, eh, let's take caution of the wind, see who we get. 
But before we did that, when we created these boards. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We like protected them. Well, like, we protected them from like nobody's freaking business. We had the salt. We had garden sage. We had all sorts of herbs on them. We, uh, yeah, yeah, we protected if I, them. If, if, I, if I've never posted those pictures before, I will post those pictures for this episode. Yeah, those were a lot of fun. Didn't work great. You know, we haven't had exactly great luck with Ouija boards when we've used them. True. I mean... Everybody, I think, has their own way of spirit communication, and not every way works for everybody. I just find conversation, not not conversation through a board, actual conversation. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and that's actually a really good point, because not every tool is for every witch. There are some witches who will find that automatic writing or that that just communicating like you do through conversation with spirit works best for them. Maybe you'll find that the pendulum is the one that works for you, but you have to try these, you know, get into a meditative state, get into an alpha state and work with these different ways of communicating with spirit until you find the one that fits, until you find the one that works for you and for your subconscious and your magical brain. You know, some people get more thoughts and ideas, especially if you're in a meditative state, it can be very easy. And and that's one of the reasons I kind of like automatic writing. Because, you know, not everybody is as good at having a a conversation with spirit um, as, say, you or someone else might be. And so, you know, kind of get yourself into an alpha state a little bit with a pencil and paper and just let your pencil start writing. Just let your hand start writing and just let it go. You know, you might be surprised at some of the different things that you get there. I I, I just think that you also don't want to think too much about it because if you think too much about it, you almost stop it from happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think that's why it's good to be kind of in a meditative state when you do that. But how you, you know, how you communicate with spirit really kind of, I guess, defines what name you're going to call it by, you know, with, with seances, you got that dark room, candlelit table, generally around four to six people. Whereas Ouija boards, you know, that could be anywhere from two to whoever many people right down to, you know, the Long Island medium going to stadiums and doing mediumship to crowds. You know, it, different people have different methods. And I think that no method is invalid. We just all get it different ways. Like I said, I I kind of more in the conversational. I know a lot of people will get visuals. Some people, it'll be all like smell based. I think it's all valid. It's just different ways over the history of time have had a different focus because they worked better or not as good for a wider majority of people. Does that make sense? Makes me think of, you know, when the Ouija board first came out, they were used by a lot of different people for different reasons. You know, it wasn't just for contacting spirits. Right. It was marketed as a game. You know, they would use it to get in touch with their creative side. They'd use it for creative writing. They'd use it, you know, people would use it by themselves, which is one of the rules you're told now not to do. Yeah, whatever. (laughs) I think that's another one of those Hollywood rules. It is. It is. There's a little bit to that. I mean, I, you know, there's times I wouldn't want to try and contact a spirit. on. I wouldn't have wanted to use a Ouija board alone in your dad's house. Right. No, 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 that's not good. That would not be good. You know, and to be honest, in the house I'm currently living now, I probably wouldn't use a Ouija board alone here either. Yeah, that's because they keep knocking stuff off of the shelves in your basement. (laughs) That's true. And all right, so maybe I'll tell you one more haunted story. So everybody has heard about the renovated church that I currently live in. And Shell and her daughter have seen quite a few spirits in my backyard. Oh, my God. The only time I haven't had an experience was literally the last time I stayed at your damn house. Now, recently, I found out some information about the house. So do you want to hear the ghost story about the house or do you want to hear the new information I found first? Oh, is the ghost story have anything to do with the fact when I sleep in your freaking living room, I feel like all your outside windows on your deck, there's people outside watching me. That's just probably the ghost from the cemetery down the road. Lord, like you are you can't be anywhere in Layla's house without being freaking watched. So the first floor of my house is where the the church was, where the pews and everything were. And in the back of the house, behind where the pulpit was, was an office that's now currently my bedroom. And right off of that is a porch. 
The second floor used to be the vaulted ceiling of the church, but it now has two bedrooms. And one of my kids' bedrooms is right above mine. So one of the first nights we were here, I go to bed and I hear violent sobbing, like someone crying, like they just lost the love of their life. Like everything is awful. And it sounds like it's right outside my door. I have a door that goes to a porch off my bedroom and my daughter's window is right above that door. So it sounded to me like someone was either right outside on my porch sobbing their eyes out or my daughter upstairs had her window open and was sobbing her eyes out. So of course, being the concerned parent, I go upstairs and check on her and she's quietly on the computer with her friends just with her headphones on. With her headphones on, just having a conversation and is perfectly happy and fine. I check on everybody else in the house. No one was anywhere near there and no one was crying. So I go back to my room and a few minutes later, I hear it again. So this time I go out to my porch and it stopped and I can hear my daughter upstairs just quietly talking to her friends, definitely not sobbing, you know, like she just heard the worst news of her life. And then it, it just went away. I live in the middle of nowhere. There's no neighbors. There's no one next to me that this could have been. And I've lived in the country before, so I know it wasn't a fox. It wasn't some random deer scream or rabbit in the middle of the night. This sounded like a young woman crying like her life was over, like there was nothing left to live for. And it was so loud and so direct. It sounded like it was literally in the room with me or just outside my screen door. And try as I might, I could not find a logical explanation for what I heard. Weird. Very weird. So just very strange. And other people have experienced things here too. Well, I just recently found out that the church was listed as being built in 1901. But so was every other building in the town. Because in 1901, the town hall burned down. And so all the records were destroyed. And when they remade all the records... Everything that was already built just got a, a building date. 1901 date. It's older than 1901, but they don't know how old. So there's my little ghost story here. Man, you and your hauntings. Hey, this, I don't know what to tell you, man. It just happens that way. But sometime you should come up here and we'll use a Ouija board and maybe try to record it again. See what happens. I say do it. I, I let, <laughs> we, we need to do it. You know, I grew up in a, in a house with a ghost, too. Her name was Cora, and I would run from my bedroom to the bathroom because Cora was going to see me if I didn't run. And, you know, I used to tell my kids about it, and, and you know, my mother would tell my kids about it, and you know how my kids are. They're like, yeah, whatever, Mom. Right. And until one day, my mom winters in Tennessee and summers in New York State, and my mother had already left for Tennessee for the winter, um, and my kids and I were at the gas station across the so street. So the house was home. empty? The house was empty um, and only my brother and I had a key and um, my kids and I were at the gas station across the street because I lived down the street from my mother at the time. My son says, mom, mom, somebody's in grandma's house. I'm like, what are you talking about? And my daughter goes, mom, somebody's in the attic window. Now you see my mother's house. It's like this three story huge house. And all three of us saw a person in the attic window on the third floor. No now, shit. because because I grew up there, I knew it was freaking Cora. I knew it. I was just like, oh my God, that's Cora the ghost. So I call my mother, you know, mom, the kids and I just saw us. She's like, and my mom looked at her cameras. It was Cora because there was no one in the house. It was no Cora. One in the house. Even wow. my mother, my mother's like, yeah, it was her. Don't worry about it. But my kids finally believed me and didn't think that I was just talking smack. Because all three of us stood at that gas pump and saw that lady in the window, like clear as day, clear as day. Yeah. You know, it's it's amazing how many people, if you ask them, will have some sort of weird story about a house that they were in, you know, where something strange like that happened. So it's no wonder that, you know, seances and, and mediumship became popular. They're still up in uh, New York State. There's still Lilydale, which is yep. a whole town of mediums and psychics and you know, you can find all of that there, particularly in the summertime. They're open and do a ton of that. Um, it's still something that's popular to this day. Uh, Harry Houdini, who was a famous magician, set out to try and debunk seances um, back in his day. And he actually found a lot of fake mediums, a lot of people who are using little tricks like, 
you know, pencils tied to their toes and, you know, assistants in the walls that could knock for them. That's why I don't like the word seance. Not that I want to say I think it's derogatory because that's not the right explanation. But when I when I hear that word, I think trickery, fakeness, you know, like exactly what Harry Houdini was trying to to set out to prove. So I just kind of like mediumship myself. I think that's because in the in the 1800s, even the Fox sisters who are credited with starting this whole spiritualist movement, they even one of them even wrote a book about how they faked all of it and proved right. how they faked it. But spiritualism and seances had gotten so popular at that time that people were just like, yeah, whatever, and just went on with it. Because it was so popular, there were fakes at that time who were very much taking advantage of people like Mary Todd Lincoln and people who were desperately sad and trying to reach their loved ones. They were vulnerable. You know, they were people in a very vulnerable position. And unfortunately, there's always going to be people that try to take advantage. Right. That's not to say that it's all fake, but I totally see what you're saying about the word seance has such a a Hollywood fakery kind of connotation to it nowadays because of that. But we know people like Alani Phoenix that we just talked to here that they know things about places and people that died there that there's no way she could have known. And she has been speaking to spirits since she was a child. I can say the same thing about you. (laughs) <laughs> I'm no I'm no Alani, that's for sure. But yeah, I mean, I saw your grandfather and, and there's times that I, I have seen and spoken to these energies or whatever you want to call them. Right. So have you. Right. You know, a lot of people have. A lot of people have these experiences. It's something, there's always been a fascination with it. I mean, you know, to, to give credit, there's always been fakes too. And I yeah. think that's just kind of the, the nature of the beast. What Harry Houdini was trying to expose, you could literally try to expose the same thing today. You know what I mean? Right. I just think what it is, is subject to being vulnerable to trickery, but that doesn't yeah. negate its validation. If you're trusting someone else to be that medium for you, you still have to follow safety procedures. You know, you still have to do your research, make sure that they have good recommendations, make sure that there's someone that you trust. You also want to make sure that you go into it with the right mindset. You know, don't give them too much information, but don't close yourself off either. Right, right. You know, the similar advice I'd give someone who's going to get a tarot reading. I would, yeah. And I'd also say don't go to a medium when you're in pain. If you're emotionally hurt and emotionally vulnerable, you definitely should not go to a medium because that's all too easy, you know, to have the wool pulled over your eyes, I guess. Um, yeah. And you want to you want to make sure that you're with someone that you can validate, that you can trust. But what's better than all of that is, you know, gain a little bit of knowledge and, and dabble in doing your own spirit communication. You know, if the medium can do it, you can do it. Yeah. Reach out to them yourself. I, I agree. I think that's the best way to do it. You don't even have to think you have any mediumship ability. Right. Just get yourself into a meditative state or even just relax and think about your loved one. Think about the spirit that you want to contact. And then while you're in this meditative state, just ask them for a way that you can know that they're there. Ask them for a way that you can identify them. Maybe a smell, maybe a, um, maybe a sound, you know, maybe a song will come on, but you can ask them for a sign to show you consistently. And I found that that seems to work for a lot of people. Okay, Layla, if I go before you, this is how you're going to get me. Okay. Billy Joel and weed. Billy Joel and weed. Absolutely. Yeah. Pretty sure that that would call you from well beyond the grave. If, if, if you need to get me and I'm gone, just put <laughs> on some Billy Joel, smoke a little bit, and I'll be right there. All right. It's a deal. If you have passed and a Billy Joel song comes on randomly, I'll know it's you. You know, it's kind of weird, but I think a lot of people tend to make comments like that. I mean, even Harry Houdini that we talked about earlier had a deal with his wife that if she did seances after his death, he had like a coded message that he said would be proof that he was there. And I know a lot of other people have mentioned, like I have one aunt who said anytime you see clouds in the shape of a horse after she passed, that that's her. So I think there's this whole idea of somehow communicating. I mean, I have other ones too. Like my grandmother said that she was going to implode a salt shaker. My mother-in-law said that one of her relatives said that they would find dimes. Really? 
Yeah. So whenever she finds a dime that's in an unusual place, she feels that it's a sign from that person. Like not one that you might find on a grocery store floor or whatever. That's pretty common. But, right. you know, you grab a dime out of someplace weird. She feels like that's a sign. So do you have anything like that? I had a grandmother. I'm sure you remember her. She was a little nutty. She always used to tell me, when I go, you're still going to hear me laugh. I shit you not. Even my kids, sometimes they've been like, you know, I feel like I hear Gigi laughing. And she kind of almost had this like, I shouldn't say witch cackle because that's such a horrible thing. <laughs> no, but, but she oh, did, though. <laughs> she did. She did. And there are times where I really do feel like I hear it. Yeah. And my one grandfather, his is cherry tobacco smoke. Uh, we'll all smell cherry tobacco smoke. And we know that he's with us, you know my literal million cousins and I, there'll be different times and we'll smell that cherry tobacco smoke and we know he's with us. You know, I did have like a weird thing and it's not normal. It, it's not a normal occurrence. But um, my other grandmother, as you know, me and my mother were a tad bit estranged for a couple of years. And this last year, we've kind of reconnected. And she actually called me at midnight on my birthday, which she hadn't really acknowledged my birthday in two or three years. So it was kind of a surprise and it was nice, but I was half asleep when she called mm. and cause she did call at midnight when we hung up the phone, it was like my grandmother was in my ear and she goes, I made her do it. And I, I like literally called my mother back and I'm like, I swear to fucking God, grandma just said this in my ear. And she, <laughs> you know, my mother's kind of a quasi believer mm -hmm. and, and she was like, you know, that sounds like something she'd say, but I am telling me it like that particular grandmother I never have felt like I've had contact with since she's passed. But that night on my birthday, her snarky ass was right in my ear. Right there. Okay. While we're telling stories, I got another one. This one was a step-grandmother who hated me, or so <laughs> I thought. <laughs> she was my stepfather's mother. And this woman, I could do no right Nothing I did was good enough for her. She constantly belittled me. and Well, and you are a witch. Whew, even before she knew I was a witch. She was a Methodist. I didn't think Methodists cared. I mean, come on. She was, whew. anyway, she was mean to me her entire life. Well, I was living in Colorado at the time, and she was dying of cancer in upstate New York. And I knew she didn't have long. And I was out one day with some friends at a pizza hut of all places. And we were, sitting, we were sitting in a corner booth. We were waiting for our food. And I kept looking behind me. You know how you can out of the corner of your eye, like when the waiter like comes somebody up. somebody there, like that peripheral vision. Yeah, like when the waiter's coming up or something, you'll catch that movement. And you'll turn and look. Well, that kept happening. Like someone was coming to the corner and then coming over to us. And I kept looking and there, was, there was no, no one, one there. there. There never was. And I kept seeing a woman with black curly hair. And it was freaking me out. To the point I made my friends get our pizza to go because it was bugging the hell out of me. We got back to my house. No sooner had we sat down with the pizza than I get a call from my brother that my grandmother had passed at the exact time I was sitting in that pizza hut. Did she have black curly hair? She had black curly hair. Oh my God. And honestly, I love that memory. I love that memory. Even though it kind of freaked me out to where I had to leave. But that woman hated me. But she came to say goodbye when she died. And that that meant a lot to me. That actually like healed a lot of wounds for me, you know, that she cared enough to be like, hey, <laughs> you know, I'm going. I was but, a dick. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was a bitch. But, you know, I'm heading to the afterworld. And she just kind of, you know, touched in. And, and that meant a lot. To this day, that's very meaningful to me that she stopped by. I like that. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, dreams. Dreams are a big way. Even if you don't think that you have any way to contact uh, your beloved dead or, or the, the dead of a place, you know, the spirits of a place, a lot of times you'll see them in your dreams. Like how often do you hear even non-believers will say so-and-so passed and they came to me in a dream? But PSA, folks, just because you see your ex in a dream doesn't mean you go back to them. Only if your ex is dead. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a bad joke. I'm sorry. That's a very bad joke. <clears throat> so a lot of times you'll see them in your dreams and, and you can kind of tell they feel different. You know, you wake up and you're like, wow, I really feel like I was talking to that person. Let me guess. You're going to tell people to journal their dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Am, am I that predictable? You are. <laughs> With journaling. Absolutely. You yes. Are. Write your dreams down, especially if it's about your beloved dead or about, you know, if you're in a haunted house like Shell was, 
Did you write about your experience in my dad's house? No, I was too traumatized. <laughs> but I will say this, you know, tis the season for ancestor altars. And that could also be a, a, a good gateway to communicate, you know, set up an ancestor altar and kind of use that as your focal point for meditation to kind of get into that communicative space. Like I, I have one going right now that I just started a few weeks back for the month. I got some things that belonged to some of my beloved dead, as well as pictures. And I have those strewn about my my normal altar space. But what I did was I ripped it apart. I cleaned it. I dusted everything and put it back together with my ancestor pieces with it and kind of use that as a focal point for that connection. You know what I mean? I love that. One last story, I promise. Uh, this is about my ancestor altar and a new piece that I just put on it. Wow, you don't usually put new stuff on. This is from a young woman who passed quite a while ago, and I knew her as a young teenager. Oh my God, I know this story and I'm going to cry. I was very close with her family. Her mother was like a big sister to me. I absolutely adored this woman and I adored her family, still adore her family. And her daughter passed tragically. And I happened uh, to talk to her. She was interested in witchcraft and in tarot. Um, great kid, wonderful human being, so bright. And she had purchased a tarot deck before she passed. And uh, just recently, I was in contact again with her mother and her sister. I absolutely love them. My friend looks just the same, absolutely gorgeous. But her daughter is all grown up and fabulous. And so remembering, remembering this young woman, they gave me her tarot deck. Oh, my heart crushes. It's wrapped in a shawl that had been her grandmother's, and it's in a box that she has signed with her name. Just the connection, you know, the the honor of giving me this piece of, you know, it's it's central right now in my on my ancestor altar because, you know, she is one of our beloved dead, and she is one of our beloved souls who have crossed the veil and. I have not yet used the deck, but I do plan on using it, you know, this Samhain season to honor her and to honor her life and to remember her. And that's what these are for. This is for you to honor these people, to, to love them still, to call to them and to remember them and to be happy. And that's what I'm going to try to do with this deck is I'm going, to, I'm going to try to remember happy things and wonderful things about her and about her life. You know, what better way to try and contact our dead, I guess. I look at Samhain as kind of almost like a family reunion. Yeah. And I don't look at it as a sad time. A lot of people kind of get that sadness with the, the whole ancestor thing, connecting with the dead, thin veil thing. Yeah. I look at it as, as almost like a reunion, like a, like a party, like everybody's coming, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I do. And I love that aspect of it. And I, I know I've been I find it more joyous than depressing. Yes. And that's what I always try to do. Even the years, you know, that I've been depressed on Samhain, remembering people that I've loved and lost, there's still that joy that they right. were here and they were part right. of everything. And that's why, you know, talking to Laura Gonzalez about Dia de los Muertos and the joy in that culture around talking about their beloved dead. You know, we we need a little more of that, I think. Right, right. So don't be afraid of the Ouija board. Don't be afraid to contact the spirits, but do it sensibly and smartly. Fuck around and find out with caution. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Charles wise wisdom for tonight. Wrap yourself in your rosemary, wrap yourself in your protective oils. And then say, bring it on, bitches. <laughs> Call to all the spirits. There you go. No, don't, please don't do that. If you go fuck around and find out in a cemetery, make sure to leave a coin at the gate or to cut the cords before you leave. And be respectful. If you do it in a cemetery, be respectful. Those are people's loved ones. And, and I do believe that these spirits are out there. And if you desecrate graves and walk on them, they will come and grab your ankles. We're coming for your ankles, man. <laughs> but leave something at the gate so that they don't follow you home. If you do do a seance, if you do call on spirits, use shell scissors analogy and cut yeah. those energies. 
You know, use smoke and cleanse yourself to cut that energy. Use music, singing upbeat songs at full volume. There's nothing better. Don't to bring that shit home. Yeah, don't bring that shit home. Yep. Don't bring it home. Do whatever you need to do to cut the connection and say goodbye. Right. With that being said, have fun. Good luck. Let us know how it goes. Or if you have any ghost stories to share, please email them to backonthebroomstick at gmail.com. Send us your orb photos because I love those. Don't tell me they're bugs. I don't want to hear it. Shh, just let me have my delusions. You can find us at Back on the Broomstick on the web, on Facebook, on Instagram, and on YouTube. We're everywhere, man. We are. Thank you for listening to Back on the Broomstick. Leave us a like, a review, some stars. It really helps the show out. And Shell and I cackle like little witches. And uh, have a safe and happy Samhain. And as always, my witches, be wise, be wicked. Keep it witchy.